welcome to Movie Night Mates, a real-time film commentary podcast. My name is Dan, and I'm joined with Dan every week by my good friend, co-host, and not replicant. Jess. I'm pretty sure. Oh. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Maybe. You gotta ask me a hundred questions, and then you'll find out. Okay, Jess, you're walking through the desert. <laughs> you see a tortoise come towards you. I don't you know what a tortoise is. What's back. a tortoise? <laughs> you know what a turtle is? Yeah. Yeah, it's like a turtle, so... <laughs> Um, and this week we are continuing sci-fi July. Ooh, we say it like that, like robots, sci-fi, like sci-fi. July. Sci- <laughs> sci-fi July. Um, <laughs> what is my purpose? You just sound like, I like am a typical podcast. high school nerd. <laughs> like, so myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this week we're doing Blade Runner, uh, a movie that came out in 1982, and created its own genre in a way um, of like this neo noir synthy dystopian sort of future. Neo noir, I think, is the best description mm-hmm. for it. Um, it's a science fiction movie, uh, but draws heavily from, you know, like the classic noir detective films of the 40s and 50s um, to kind of help inform its world. And because there's a lot to the world, so, you know, those kinds of little shorthands uh, help. Mm-hmm. Um, now, we watched the final cut this week. Uh, there are... Do you want to guess how many versions of this movie there are? Oh, Lord. I don't... Five. Seven. Okay. Seven different versions <laughs> Jesus. of this movie. There was a work print version, a San Diego sneak work preview... Print? Um, so that was one that was, like, kind of sent out before, like, for test audiences and whatnot. Oh, okay. Um, and that resulted in the U.S. theatrical version, which is much different in, like, how it's honestly a bad movie. <laughs> the theatrical version, I do not like that movie. That's really funny. It's really bad. Um, then there's an international theatrical version, then a U.S. TV broadcast version. Ah, uh-huh, classic. Then the director's cut from 1992, and this, the final cut, was released in 2007. If you're going to watch it, watch the final cut. If not, maybe the director's cut, but the final cut is, like, the best version. Yeah. This is a 1982 movie directed by Ridley Scott based off Philip K. Dick's uh, novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, uh, which came out in 1968, and very much kind of follows a similar premise to Blade Runner. It follows a man named Rick Deckard, who in this version is just a bounty hunter, who hunts down um, Nexus 6 model androids, which are replicants. Um, And then also a man named uh, John Isidore, who aids the the fugitive android people. Um, But there are some massive differences, like... Basically, Ridley Scott kind of created this world, like, uh, from, from the ground up, like, in this, he, yeah. he and his production team. Um, the book isn't, like, and then there was a giant billboard of an ad of a <laughs> geisha lady, and it was really cool and raining and stuff. No, like, they And then in the 60s, vision. the book was, like, and then Synthwave started playing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which, I gotta give a shout out, I'm gonna say it multiple times, uh, the soundtrack Vangelis did the soundtrack for that you might also recognize his work from uh chariots of fire the dun, 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 dun. oh nah, yeah, nah, 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 yeah that's him oh okay as well he died two months ago oh, unfortunately wow. in may of 2022 due to heart failure from complications due to covid19 uh, yeah. got to love it not <laughs> uh, but more on kind of the the background of who's in this harrison ford is in this Han Solo, Indiana Jones. I'm not gonna himself. lie. I completely forgot he was in this, and then I looked like at the main the, character. Yeah, and then the because I was watching it on your voodoo. Thanks, bestie. And Epic. I opened it and like basically just like like you know organized alphabetically went down to B and then like clicked on it, clicked play, and was like, huh, that kind of looked like Harrison Ford. And then like it started, and I was like, oh, it's because he's the main character. That is Harrison Ford. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of his like big characters, like. I just, I think it honestly slipped my mind. I watched it pretty early in the morning, so I, like, wasn't thinking. I was just like, oh, duh. (laughs) Like, I would kill to have 
even one iconic character to play, but he has, like, at least five. Yeah. I would say, like, he has Indiana Jones, Han Solo, and Rick Deckard off the bat. Yeah. Uh, but then, like, you can, like, go into his other kind of one, one-off one characters when he played, like, the president in Air Force One or Jack Ryan, that kind of stuff. I feel um, like I always see things that he, like, doesn't, he didn't really want to be known as Han Solo, and yet that's like kind of how people know his face yeah i know that he really likes this he likes blade runner he likes rick deckard and he likes it being indiana jones Indiana Jones too yeah yeah um yeah (laughs) solo anyway um it also has (laughs) sean young uh, and edward james Olmos, as well as daryl hannah of splash fame william sanderson and and a few others that that pop up here and there but um just kind of initial impressions of this movie this is background uh for this if you're first it's your first time listening to an episode of ours our general premise is that hopefully one or both of us have not seen the movie that we're viewing before this will be jess's first time seeing the movie it was my fourth or fifth time seeing the movie and i've seen blade runner 2049 just about as many times and I've, like, read all the backstories, and I've seen all the short films they made in between Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049. Uh, so I know that my perspective coming into this is privileged with that knowledge. Uh, so I'm interested to hear what you, like, made of it and, like... I'm going to give, like, um, a toddler's review of this in comparison to <laughs> Well, no, but that's everything. helpful because, I mean, the reason that I don't like the theatrical version of this movie uh, is that there is a well one the ending is different and two there is a continuous like voiceover from harrison ford which oh is, yeah 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 I remember really you that. really not good yeah um and like that like sucks to have to record all of that and then just not use it <laughs> well he you could if you listen to it he just sounds so disinterested because he didn't want to do it he felt it was a waste of time yeah but because of test audience reactions, they were like, nobody understands it. So, like, he had to come in and, like, explain everything that's happening. Yeah. Right down to the end of the movie. It's really funny watching um, the end. Uh, by the way, just before I say that, spoiler warning. <laughs> um, but the non-spoiler reviews, as almost all the time I'm going to say, go watch this, the movie. Definitely go watch this movie. It's really good. It's iconic and uh, influential in so many different ways Uh like the modern sci-fi genre Mm -hmm. it would not be where it is without this movie despite the fact it was a total flop uh so that's what i'm gonna say jess do you have anything to to say non-spoilery um the second half is far better than the first (laughs) Mm -hmm. okay spoiler 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 so the ending of the movie in the theatrical version is like uses (laughs) onion unused footage from the shining of like a car driving in like a beautiful forest and like it's like deckard and rachel like leaving the city and like oh my god like it's so happy and what the hell everything (laughs) also in the theatrical version there is no question as to whether or not deckard or is a replicant or not it's like very clear he's a human there's no like existentialism to it and also at the end when roy dies he like just finishes up his amazing death speech and then uh, harrison ford's voiceover kicks in and it's like i don't just like (laughs) it was just like it really kills the mood because he just explains what just happened to the audience um and also in the theatrical version he kind of drops the n-word uh in his voiceover describing his uh bryant his supervisor the guy who calls um replicant skin jobs he's like he's the kind of cop who would call a black man mm, in the 60s or whatever i'm like Ooh, okay, jesus let's keep you that could just version. describe that he's not a good person <laughs> in any other way <laughs> yeah <laughs> like- <laughs> um so that's why i don't like the theatrical version mm-hmm. but we can kind of jump into the plot of this one um right now and, and kind of jump into the review yeah. great start to the movie um it kicks in with the (laughs) blade runner music (laughs) oh yeah that's my own little vangelis going in the background um has like a star wars crawl kind of explaining what replicants are where they came from so were you like picking up like i know this movie can be confusing to people so i i don't want to come off as patronizing or mansplaining at any time but 
please, if I'm going too far <laughs> and, like, getting into it yeah. and you want anything cleared up or, like, add your own, like, oh, this took me a second to, like, register what was actually happening here. That I know that's will... like, a pretty common um, criticism of this movie is yeah. that it is a little hard to understand. I think I, first like, doing. the the first half of it, I was trying to play a lot of catch-up. Like, I was trying to be like, wait, why are they doing any of this? I'm trying to understand mm-hmm. what they're saying. But then, like, as it went on... Like, basically, it was, like, I caught up to what was happening in the plot by the final scene, like, kind of deal. So, like, I was basically (laughs) the entire time trying to be, like, why are they doing any of this? Like, I'm trying to understand, like, what's going on. And then, like, with the whole, like, you know, final monologue, I was, like, okay, no, that's, okay. I think I was, like, in it the whole time. Like, I think I understood what was going on. But I also, and I typically don't ever do this, like, you and Julie will go to, like, Reddit or Letterboxd and, like, read reviews and read things about, like, media after you've consumed it. I literally mm-hmm. never do that. I just, like, form an opinion, which if you've listened to any episode <laughs> that we've done, you could kind of tell I'm the one that's, like, I liked it or I did not like it. <laughs> but I did actually go onto Reddit afterwards and I was, like, what made this movie such a big deal? And the one thing I'll get this out of the way is that I came into this watching this movie 40 years after it released. Like, I enjoyed it. but Like Alien. Yeah, but... I have seen all of the ripoffs before, or like the things that were impacted by this before I saw this. So then it also being kind of a slower movie until like the end, I was like, well, I've like seen this before. And I kept trying to remind myself, like, no, this is why <laughs> like I've seen anything that I have that's been yeah. impacted by it. So I think that was also an interesting perspective, kind of coming into it and being like, yeah, this is cool and all, but like I've seen cooler. And I'm like, okay, but those literally wouldn't exist if this didn't, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, and thank you for mentioning that because I wanted to do that in kind of the preamble and forgot to kind of like go over some of the stuff that it did influence. I mean, yeah. aside from just creating like kind of the cyber noir synthy yeah. future, um, you know, it's like video games like Cyberpunk 2077 yeah. basically ripped everything out of this One movie. million percent. Like, and I kept being like, this is really like Cyberpunk. You know, I think I did this in <laughs> Cyberpunk. This looks a lot like you Cyberpunk. You can literally <laughs> get, I'm pretty sure you can get a version of like one of the cars that looks like Deckard's yeah, I'm sure. car. Um, all the cars in this are Peugeot, by the way, which is so funny to me. Oh. Um, you can get his gun, like that cool looking like thing but yeah you know it, it it inspired so many different movies video games yeah. um like the deus x series is really influenced by it um even what's his face elon musk's stupid cyber truck is basically like it's the dumbest thing i've ever seen <laughs> yeah um and it, it just really really when you see it now you kind of as you said it's like you're going backwards exactly. from where yeah where it started and like comparing it to the things that have come out since. But yes, thank you. I, that's actually a, a really good, um, yeah. helpful observation. Shout to out add to in. whatever uh, redditor uh, posted that like eight years ago, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you know what, buddy, you're right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and it also spawned you know a sequel, which you know in the style of the original Blade Runner also flopped at the box office. <laughs> Um, and an anime series that apparently people have been saying is not actually like Blade Runner. It seems like someone just developed an anime series, and then we're like, oh shit, wait, we can make this into Blade Runner. Um, <laughs> That's really funny. There are three, and I was gonna not not gonna mention them to you before this because obviously you should watch them kind of after we discuss and before Blade Runner twenty forty nine. There are three short films that came out before twenty forty nine. So if you guys are gonna watch that with us next week, make sure to check them out. Um, that kind of detail just big events that happened in between the two of them um, the first of which is a the longest it's a 15 minute anime short film made by the creator of uh, Cowboy Bebop mm. who it's about this big worldwide blackout that happened um, in 2022 and then the other two are just like four minutes and five minutes one of them does have Morbius himself in it oh so my god you can shut stand up it, yeah <laughs> But, yeah, check those out before review our 2049 yeah, <laughs> review next week. But back to the plot of Blade Runner. Um, so the replicants are a basically clone slave workforce. They are not robots at all. None of No part of them is syn- synthetic. They are entirely made out of meat and bones and everything. But they are, like, grown artificially and... You can basically program them when they are created to have a shorter lifespan, obey specific people or commands or whatever. So they more or less act robotic when they are 
around, um, and they are fully grown to the size that they are. They don't start out as children and then grow up. They are immediately like a 45-year-old man or whatever, or woman or whatever you need them to be. Anyway, they were developed, and then they were like, hey, this fucking blows. So there was a huge (laughs) revolt, and basically they were outlawed on Earth. Um, And so a specific sect of police detectives were created called Blade Runners to hunt and quote-unquote retire them forcefully, which is killing them. Uh, And the main character of this movie, Deckard, was one of those, but has since retired. Um, It starts in Los Angeles, November 2019. uh, And you get this sweeping shot, which I love. It's like such an affecting effective opening shot of LA uh, with the music kind of combines with the visuals and the effects in such a good way as it kind of zooms through this dystopian future LA of like these, I don't even know what they are, I guess gas towers blowing fire into the air and it zooms it onto the Tyrell headquarters. They were who made the replicants. This is probably like the most uh, chronically online thing I'm ever going to say. But Mm -hmm. just the fact that, again, this is a movie that was from the 80s. So like the effects in that one shot, like I'm not saying they don't hold up, but like it's very clear that it's like a real fire over kind of like a picture of like L.A., whatever. So it reminded me of all of those memes where it's, like, someone's, like, dog or, like, they're cooking something or whatever, and then, like, they put over, like, a video of, like, a missile strike or, like, a plane <laughs> crash because the yeah. fire was so real and everything behind it, like, did not look like that. Yeah, and it's, I, like, that all was all miniature. I could think of, and I was, like, I need to, like, hold on, let me get into, the like, the mood of this movie. <laughs> yeah. It's some great miniature work, though. It is, that. Like, it that is. was all made like they did for like uh star wars and stuff mm-hmm. but so I, I love that but yeah it is it, it was the funny. effects of this don't hold up as well as alien because they aren't as shrouded in darkness just which in... lets you get away with a lot true but also um, like just in a few of the shots like a lot of yeah. a lot of it was still really impressive that is that is a good good point to make um but i mean honestly even though it's 2019 it's pretty accurate i mean it's not we don't have like flying cars but like it, we live in a dystopia and, <laughs> yeah. you know, everybody's falling in love with people who aren't real all the time and, and all that Yeah, good me and stuff. my YouTuber girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, just depression and isolationism are, mm-hmm. are rampant. And that's where kind of the cyber noir, cyberpunk, synth, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. future kind of comes from is, is stemmed in a lot of those, like, anxieties of specifically the 80s late 70s of like ra- like rapid corporate greed growth reagan's america and like what that would lead to and this was the future that like people like ridley scott saw of just unchecked capitalism leads to this a future where it's just like everybody is so isolated capitalism and technology too so isolated from each other um they the environment is clearly fucked up because it's raining all the time in la now um there are you know basically this movie is the police exist to keep down the working class Mm -hmm. not to necessarily help people Hmm. uh and to to (laughs) aid the rich more or less you know there's some there's some uh, there's some views you can take on this movie uh more like based runner i'm gonna say yeah i would i would second that (laughs) um Sorry, we, I keep getting distracted by the themes and not the form. True. Sorry. Uh, Leon Kowalski, we see him being interviewed with a Voight Kampf test. That is the test that Blade Runners use. It's a series of questions that they ask while recording a replicant or person's uh, responses, their eyes. Eyes are a huge part of this movie. It opens with like a big all seeing eye. The Voight Kampf test records your eye. Later in the movie, you see that replicants' eyes glow in certain light, which I love that Let effect. Let me just it's say really, one really thing. Cool. People with blue eyes, be like, that is this movie. <laughs> you got something to say? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Sorry for yeah, those of you like listening kind of and like... not watching. Dan just opened his eyes yeah. really <laughs> <laughs> But... Yeah, being like eyes and, and you know are, are a huge part of the movie. So keep keep that in mind while you're watching it. Of uh, just kind of like constant surveillance. They're also like t- seen as like a window to the soul. And this movie is a lot about like what has a soul and what doesn't. How can we deem that? Are we allowed to decide on what has a soul and what doesn't? 
and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so eyes are a huge part of this. But he's being asked a Voight comp test. It's just a bunch of questions to gauge empathy responses because the Nexus 6 replicants, which is what are featured mostly in this movie, um, are born without anything. They live for four years. That's it. So they have nothing to really draw on for proper empathetic responses for how old they appear. Um, so the Void Comp test basically susses it out of them with really like awkward, weird questions uh, to kind of gauge how they really are and if they are a replicant or not. Mm -hmm. um, I really like the quick back and forth of this scene of, and we kind of did that when we opened the, the, the show, <laughs> yeah. of like, the guy who's interviewing Leon is clearly has done this a billion times and like is answered their question so many times about like, well, what's a tortoise and all that. And he's really kind of over it. Um, and it just feels really organic and nice to kind of start the movie off with after such an epic opening sweeping shot of just now it's bureaucracy and just two men bickering in a boardroom or office or whatever it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, the Voight test works and um, Leon is quickly sussed out as a replicant, but shoots his interviewer and flees. That was uh, literally a jump scare. Like, I was the... so into what they were talking <laughs> about, and then he shot him out of literally nowhere, and I jumped. <laughs> like, I yeah. literally jumped. <laughs> but he's like, you want to hear about my mother? Bam! Yeah, bam, it was bam. so fast. Um, but Holden doesn't die. We find that out later mm -hmm. in the movie. He's, he's still alive. Uh, I really like the Void Comp test. It's such an interesting tool uh created for for this world uh and I, I really appreciate that it exists and such a weird thing um to suss out what is and isn't a replicant it kind of establishes also uh some of the things we learn later in the movie and the world changing um we then just get more sweeping shots of the city as we're kind of brought to meet deckard uh, by the way take a shot if you're willing every time you see a giant ad in this movie yeah for real. um there is actually something called the blade runner curse oh, have you heard of that no. before oh my god okay so oh uh, wait can i do that like um those tiktok guys who like clearly have a script to every <laughs> podcast <laughs> sure, sure. so there's this thing called the blade runner curse have, have you heard of that before no i haven't <laughs> okay so well it's this thing <laughs> where <laughs> um it's that every major brand that was featured in this movie and paid to have themselves oh, featured yeah. uh, later failed, yeah. with the exception of Coca-Cola. That's the only one. So you see Pan Am, you see uh, Atari, TDK, all these big brands from the 80s, which kind of, in a way, jinxed themselves, if you like. Yeah think about it by saying like we're gonna be around and huge in nine in 2019 uh which is very much not the case yeah. uh oh rca is another one bell telephones that kind of mm -hmm, stuff mm -hmm. um which i just find really really funny and so we then meet um deckard and it's a really good world establishment because before we got to see kind of the upper echelon of society flying cars nice board like office rooms tall buildings and now he's on the street ground level um which is a lot dirtier but also has a lot more like kind of personality to it uh, a lot of cultures coming together to kind of create this world and uh, you just kind of see different people throughout the movie um and it's like everybody who's in the background is interesting uh, mm -hmm. and, and I really, really appreciate that about that. Um, and I really appreciate also in this scene Deckard's dedication to his ramen because he is ordering ramen and then Gaff, who works for the police, comes to pick him up because he's like, you got to go meet uh, Bryant, our supervisor. And he's like, I retired. And he's like, yeah, but we need you. And he's like, okay but he still brings his little bag of ramen to eat in the car, uh, which also, I really, really like. like. Then, because I was like, oh, that's so cute. Like, I would definitely do the same thing. And then it, the shot of him, like, in the car as they're, like, flying over to, like, the station, I guess, or whatever, it, like, literally has no liquid in it. Like, it's just the noodles. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that they definitely did that for, like, recording a movie purposes, but I was just like, that looks disgusting. <laughs> well. There is no broth in that. <laughs> 
Jess doesn't put broth on her. Like, she'll just take it out and doesn't dump any more broth in. Yeah, she just takes the noodles out. I don't get it. I don't get it, yeah. man. You gotta slurp up the the broth. It's so good. That's what the I must is. also point out his introduction, Rick's introduction. I want his jacket, like I always Classic. do. Every movie. Um, not as much as some others, but like it's pretty cool. Yeah, I like the cool like ridging of it. There's some insane jackets in this movie. This is mostly true. worn by Rachel. Yeah, <laughs> which we'll get to. Her, I kept um, being like, she wore at one point. I'm getting ahead of myself, but she wore like a like a big black fur coat, and I was like, oh, yeah. she's gonna have some fits. I think that's like the second outfit she wears, and then every fit after that was awful. <laughs> and I was like, girl, <laughs> put the shoulder pads away. Well, yeah, the fir- yeah, the first one that she shows up in like the really sharp shoulder. Pad. Yeah, yeah. Um. So now Deckard's with his supervisor, Bryant, who's explaining what has happened. Uh, Six replicants broke out um, off-world, killed 23 people, came to Earth, tried to break into a Tyrell headquarters. Two of them died in the process, but four are still at large, including Leon from the opening scene. Uh, And he wants Deckard to come back and help retire all four of them. and is more or less just forcing him to. There's not not really anything he can do to avoid it. Mm-hmm. And this is where I made the note that like Blade Runners are kind of an interesting note or commentary on the police's purpose to oppress a working class. Yeah. Um, basically, like that's what they do. They exist now to kill these people who weren't really asked to be made, and then had all their rights stripped from them. Uh, so. Yeah, that's a little loaded, I'm going to say. But it's it's a, it's a really interesting story. Uh, and it kind of gets more and more uh, weird and prescient as, as we go on mm-hmm. in time. The Replicant group are trying to... Oh, sorry. Uh, they were all Nexus 6s as well, which are, is the latest version of the Replicant. So they are really effective at what they do. I believe Roy and Leon were kind of combat models. Uh, there's also Pris, who is a pleasure model, and Zora, uh, as well, who is, I'm not really sure what her purpose was, or if she was, like, some, just kind of a regular, I just, just like that they went person. into all of their superpowers. A worker. I was like, good for yeah. them. Yeah. It was basically like, hey, here are your four bosses for the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't wait for the boss fights. Um, and so Decker then goes to the Tyrell headquarters pyramid to interview, uh, the head of Tyrell, Eldon Tyrell, who is played by Joe Turkle. Um, <laughs> there's an owl in the waiting room, and he meets Rachel for the first time here. Uh, he's like, is it artificial? Talking about the owl, and she's like, oh, of course it is. And that's where you first see that reflective eye effect Do you on know something. how they did that? Um, I don't, actually. Because I've only ever seen that in, like, Snapchats of people's cats. Like, I know that that happens in your eyes, yeah. you know, like, with Flash or something. But, like, <clears throat> there was one scene with Rachel and... I do ha- I have an answer. Okay. Sorry, keep going. Uh, there was one scene later where, like, you were supposed to see it in, like, Rachel's eyes, and then you can, like, kind of mm-hmm. see it in Decker's eyes, like, a little bit. I think it's, like, three quarters yeah, of the Yeah, I was going to say... But it yep. was, like, one of those things that I was... And also, at that point, you're, like, still supposed to be guessing whether or not they're hinting at him also being one. And so I was, like, is that, like, me watching a movie 40 years after it was made? And so, like, I can tell... Like, you know, when you, like, see strings in movies or something, I was, like, I was at, like, a like a thing that I wasn't supposed to see or not. And then, obviously, yeah, it's, like, Yeah, if it was okay, just, yeah. like, they left on the yeah, effect exactly. or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So how do they do So it? they use a two-way mirror... 50% transmission, 50% reflection, and place it in front of the camera's lens at a 45-degree angle. Yeah. This is better known as the Schuftan process, a technique invented by Fritz Lang from Metropolis, uh, which also happens to be, it says, one of the inspirations for it. Thank you, Film School Rejects, for that answer. Cool. So you are uh, you, you, you're a photo person. Yes. You can probably explain or understand that better than I can. It's basically um, like... I don't really they, know how that works. They, like, but... since they have, like, the mirror, it's, like, reflecting light in a certain way so mm-hmm. that it's, like, going directly into their eyes and their eyes only so that it's not, like, their whole face is then lighting up. It's, like, the angle that they Excellent. have it at is reflecting inside of your eyes instead of... Perfect. Yeah. That's cool. All right. Well, yeah, it <laughs> makes for a really cool effect. I like yeah, it. Yeah, totally. A lot. Um, and she... He introduces himself to Rachel. Uh, she asks him, have you ever retired a human by mistake? And he says, no, he has not. 
and she was basically like well what if like what would you do if, you, if like that happened um mm-hmm. this is where eldon tyrell enters and asks to see deckard's skills um and asks him to perform a void comp test on rachel which he does uh this is when you can kind of see the replicant gro- glow on her eyes is during the scene um but she's doing like exceptionally well on the void comp test they say when it's first introduced that response time is a factor and she basically responds almost instantaneously after deckard finishes a question or even before he's done finishing the question mm-hmm. and almost all of them are pretty appropriate responses um i did like the part i always forget this line and then i watched the movie where he's like talking about you see a picture of a half naked lady in yeah. a magazine and she's like is this testing whether i'm a replicant or a lesbian deckard yeah. and he's like ha 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 uh but he eventually figures out that she is a replicant, but it took him over 100 questions to do so when the standard is around 30 uh, to, to get the answer pretty easily. Um, Tyrell says she is more human than human as the Nexus 7 model replicant, which is what she is, has implanted memories to help establish a personality and humanity. And she has the memories of Tyrell's uh, niece to kind of help flesh out who she is um and to draw on easily to have those empathetic responses and also be more of a i don't want to say more of a human being but closer to a human being from our perspective than the earlier models but a lot of this movie's question is are those earlier models do they not deserve the right of life and like being able to choose their own path uh because they don't have that i say they are totally right. This is a movie where the villains are basically right the whole time. Like, I yeah. like those kinds of movies that kind of put a morally gray, and honestly, Deckard's pretty bad at what he does. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, he's good at, like, the sussing out who they are part, but the actual killing them part is he, this a little tough for him. This whole movie is Harrison Ford, like, flopping around and looking mm-hmm. really confused. <laughs> like, that's the entire, every yeah. combat scene is him, like, like with his mouth like mouth breathing and just like running after I was going to say that later like I have that in my notes for when he's fighting Roy <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> nobody does like flustered heat of battle fear like Harrison Ford yeah. does he has such a specific way if you've seen Indiana Jones or Star Wars he it shines through there it's more in Indiana Jones cuz Han Solo is like too cool yeah but like he just looks terrified and confused <laughs> yeah, and he's like, like the whole time <laughs> his hands are like shaking with the gun yeah. <laughs> i love it um but <laughs> back to the movie uh where we are now he then leaves to go investigate uh, Leon's hotel room that he's staying in. He finds a bunch of pictures that Leon had stored uh, and finds like a weird residue in the uh, bathtub as well as a scale from something. We see, then see Gaff, who's kind of like Deckard's handler because Deckard isn't officially part of the police force anymore. So he's traveling with Deckard everywhere. He's just kind of standing there making a little origami man, which he leaves uh, at the scene. Does then his we origamis get... mean anything? Because when they're in the station, he makes like a swan or a bird or something. And then yes, he makes a so like the bird. origami are just kind of something he does to pass the time. But later in the movie, you see a pretty important one that he creates oh, uh, okay. that helps <laughs> uh, open a lot of questions. Uh, oh, good. I'm I'm excited to get to that point. Then it's literally the end of the movie, though, so we have a little bit of time. We now meet Roy Batty, who is the leader of the replicant rebels rebelicants we'll call them uh his first line is time enough and then he meets up with leon they move sorry i can't read my own damn writing oh they go to damn, meet these Chu. left-handed people out here can't yeah, even read their own handwriting you're left-handed too. yeah i type my notes that's why <laughs> um they meet chu who is an eye maker for the Tyrell Corporation. He designs all the eyes and the replicant models, including Roy and Leon's. He's played by James Hong, who is just like a king. If you've basically seen more than five movies, you've probably seen him pop up. He was most recently in Everything, Everywhere, All at Once as the lead character's elderly father who would come to visit. But he's in a lot of stuff. He has a very, very recognizable voice. He's also in the Kung Fu Panda movies. He plays Poe's dad the goose or duck whatever he is um 
he was in an episode of Avatar The Last Airbender, the Avatar Day one specifically. He's, like, the one who's accusing um, Aang of, like, destroying their how like their precious whatever because of what kiyoshi did in the past oh yeah yeah yeah. Um, oh my god that's so funny yeah he's in a lot he's like one of those actors i think he has like something over like 300 credited roles 650 holy television and movie credits as of 2022 that's awesome um one of the most prolific actors ever anywhere but they basically are like trying to find answers about their own lifespans and what they can possibly do to change that Mm -hmm. uh that's their goal but he doesn't really know anything and it's kind of interesting to see them as like they're more or less like two-year-old four-year-old leon is two roy is four and leon's like sticking his hand in liquid nitrogen and like ow that kind of hurt (laughs) (laughs) like they're just like they're literally just children like operating with these enormous powerful strong fast bodies um and Leon's like taking eyeballs and putting them on the dude's shoulders, <laughs> like yeah. just like squishing them and stuff. Exactly, <laughs> like they're intimidating him and stuff. But he tells them that Tyrell will know the answer, uh, so they leave. I don't know if they kill him um, or not, but he yeah. also says to get to Tyrell, they need to find a man named J.F. Sebastian. Um, so they leave. Then De- we go back to Deckard. He heads home. Uh, Rachel is just standing in his elevator and he pulls a gun on her because he's like, whoa, who are you? What's going on here? Um, and she's wearing her big ass coat, the big ass, the black one, I think, in this scene. Um, and she always looks so funny in these. Later in the movie, I made a really good observation about one of her coats and I'm excited to get to that, but a little bit of sizzle for later. Yeah. Um, she goes to Deckard's apartment with him and it's very like Nostromo tiling. I really appreciate it. Like, going back to Alien, which was also directed by Ridley Scott. Like, it has that, like, white weirdness, almost, like, plasticky whatever look to it. Um, I wrote down here, single men will live like this and see nothing wrong with it. Oh, Um, my God. (laughs) Because his apartment's, like, just messy as shit. Yeah. It's, like, there's no (laughs) design to it. He just has stuff everywhere. That's so Um, funny. I did like his little chair for sitting in while he talks to his zoom in computer Mm -hmm, and like mm -hmm. i like his bed is like it's really cool but you know it's like come on man yeah it is probably the coziest place in the movie though it's true some of the other like apartments and places that people live i'm like damn bitch you live like this couldn't be especially jf sebastian for real what the fuck use a use a vacuum do they not have vacuums in the future please (laughs) (laughs) like (laughs) yeah um Deckard, like, lists off some memories of Rachel's that she's never told anybody and that freaks her out and she didn't know that she was a replicant, which is different from previous versions Mm -hmm. who are very aware that they're a replicant, but because of her memories, it's, like, really hard for her to comprehend. That's why people think that Deckard might be a replicant, too, because he would be a Nexus 8 model, uh, which would be, like, the next, or Nexus 7 as well as her and, like, kind of that next evolution. Or maybe Nexus 8. I don't know. Nexus 8 might be in the next movie. We'll get to that one. (laughs) Um, But he almost like immediately kind of feels bad about outing her as a replicant to herself and Mm -hmm. is like, you know what? I just made a bad call. You're a human. You can go home. Like, there's nothing to worry about. But she like kind of presses him for more answers. And um, she then tells him a story about how when she was a kid or he starts the story, she finishes it, that she saw a spider. make a web outside her bedroom window and one day there was a little sack in it and when it burst all the little baby spiders came out and ate their mother which is kind of foreshadowing for later about like killing one's own creator and uh, meaning and uh yeah so this was also the scene where my note was is deckard gonna fuck a robot she's not a robot she's a person yeah, like, but, they're still people. Yeah, like, they're, but... it's not like she's made out of metal or but I was anything. She's still all flesh and blood. <laughs> hey, maybe he will. But if he is also a replicant, then whatever. Mm-hmm. Personally, and we can get into that. I don't think he's a replicant, mostly because of Blade Runner 2049. It doesn't answer the question, but I think it's a more effective story if he is a human mm-hmm. in that one. Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll see why. But also, there's, like, reasons in this, I think, that he is a human. But... Uh, there's also a lot of good points to say that he's a replicant, too. Um, she leaves, 
after getting really upset, and she uh, knocks a photo on the floor um, of, I guess she thought was her and her mother, which would not be the case. Uh, we then get the most prolific song in the soundtrack playing, Blade Runner Blues is what it's called. It's like this synthy sax thing <laughs> while Deckard wraps himself in blankets and stands on his uh lonely lonely terrace mm-hmm. drinking scotch out of a really cool tumbler he looks like that meme of uh from saturday night live of andy samberg playing a 19 like a teenager who just woke up um that's <laughs> that's him here like just a billion blankets <laughs> around him um i vibe cat if that's a verb vibe catted to this every time i was just <laughs> yeah. back and forth <laughs> bobbing my head um and then that fades into Pris. This kind of theme, literal music theme, uh, pervades the movie. It comes back a few times, and it's very much used when people are emotionally low or alone or both. Um, it comes back later when he kills Zora and kind of makes it into a more effective and, and gut-wrenching scene. But now we get to see Pris, played by Daryl Hannah. She's quote-unquote living on the streets. She meets... J.F. Sebastian, very coincidentally, by hiding or sleeping in trash outside his house. Um, and he invites her in, like, to help her. She... I gotta say, this man, I feel bad for J.F. Sebastian. Yeah. He's, like, a genuinely nice person. <laughs> he he's just gets little, used. He's a little bit of a freak, but... <laughs> he is a little freaky, <laughs> a little, but, like, in this world, there, but, uh... <laughs> who isn't, <laughs> you Fair. know? But they're also in their meeting, so they, like, startle each other, because, like, she... Also... Mm-hmm. Was she sleeping? Because she just sat down in trash and like thirty no, seconds later. No, I think later... she's. I think she's. Sub- Roy told her to do that. I think Got it. it's just entirely part of the plan Got that it. she was supposed to look like she was. Look like she to was there. Okay, her. that's what I thought. Yeah. But then, so they startle each other, and then she like goes to run away, but like runs into his van, and the sound effect that they used for her breaking the glass of like the door <laughs> on the car was so fucking funny. I was like losing my mind, and I literally had to rewind to see what they were saying to each other because I was laughing so hard. Like I don't know what it was. Maybe because it was like you know the sax, the like low vibe, whatever. It's like rainy, and then it was just like yeah. stock sound effect of glass breaking, and I like <laughs> lost my mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that clangy sound. I know yeah, exactly yeah, what you're yeah, talking yeah, exactly. about. Um, <laughs> it was so funny. So I thought he lived in an abandoned department store. We find out later that it's an actual apartment building called the Bradbury. I literally Maybe thought it was a, a hotel. reference to I Ray Bradbury missed... or yeah, cause I something. Think I missed that it was supposed to be like an actual apartment building because they go up in this like rickety old elevator. I was like, this looks yeah, like a hotel. Yeah, and it's like <laughs> leaking and weird. Yeah. Oh my God. But... He invites her in. Uh, He is a genetic designer for the Tyrell Corporation. He basically helps create the replicants fully um, and program them. And he, quote-unquote, makes friends for himself, which are these, like, little toy men. Uh And, yeah, they are weird. They're Uh very, very strange. (laughs) Uh, Straight out of Labyrinth. Like, they feel, like, out of place in the movie, honestly. Very much so. Very Um, much so. Like, they feel more fantastical than weird sci-fi but they basically just function like alexas um around his house and like just do things he's already programmed them to do and you hear later that they will just go up to the door when someone opens it and say like their weird welcome home jf thing yeah uh it doesn't even he doesn't even need to be there uh so he's a very lonely person um and that's kind of where it goes. He, he yep. just kind of, like, helps her get settled. Now we get one of the most important scenes in the movie of Deckard kind of falling asleep while playing his piano, like, still drunk and sad. And he starts to dream about a unicorn running through a forest, which we'll get back to later. Um, then Deckard <laughs> cuddles up in his little photo analysis chair and just sits in front of a TV saying, like, go here go there as he scans in a picture that he found yeah (laughs) yeah he found he looks at one of the pictures that he found in leon's hotel room um to see if he can like get any more clues out of it and i just we spoke about this with alien and it's true in this too i love old quote-unquote future technology where like he has to have a whole machine dedicated to 
analyzing yeah. a photo and zooming in on it when that's something you can literally do with something that you carry around in your pocket nowadays. He could use um, his voice though. We still have to like. You, you know. probably could. There's probably, probably something could. for like, <laughs> yeah. probably an accessibility for like people. His who are also blind. had the cool like lines. And every I don't time know why he they said would... a direction, it flashed for like three seconds and then zoomed in. It was really yeah, yeah. I know the lines from that scene so well because on the soundtrack they're used as like just like a voice thing at the start of it, like with the theme song in the background. Um, but yeah, (laughs) he, um, then kind of enhances the photo to see a reflection of someone else in the room, uh, who is like covered in some weird scaly stuff. And he's like, oh, that's the person who left that behind. But also in this scene and a lot of other scenes, it just, it's really easy to notice that there's like never true quiet in this world. There's always, even I'm assuming this is like pretty late at night. There are like bright lights always constantly coming through his windows, constant city sounds, advertisements, discussions, whatever Mm -hmm. cars in the background. So it's never really like there, there's never a moment of peace here, which I I really appreciate too. I don't know if you, you noticed that, but also you live in a city, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I also city sounds. City life. sounds are like relaxing to me. Like even when I lived in the <laughs> suburbs, they're like at school and like middle of nowhere. I like the sleep sounds that I would play is rain and city sounds. So, <laughs> so this so it was quiet good, to me. <laughs> it's a good thing you didn't watch this like late at night, otherwise you might have like fallen asleep. Yeah, this is true. Like, this is true. There are some really good like probably ASMR. Oh, I'm sure. Blade Run, Blade Runner. Los Angeles sounds yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so he then goes to find who basically has this snake thing. Um, so he takes the scale to get analyzed. This is where we get my favorite extra. Uh, it's a guy who's just walking across the street with like a full on like vulture or crow or whatever just on his head. Oh, it's, uh, it's alive. And he's just walking around with it. That was, was my probably least my f- favorite person. Because the bird, you failed to mention, is flapping its fucking wings the whole time he's walking. And then someone's, like, sitting there. Or, like, maybe maybe it was uh, Deckard, I forget. But somebody is just, like, sitting there. And he walks so close to the guy. And the bird flaps on his head. Why do you like that guy? <laughs> I just think it's pretty badass. Him so and scary. there's also some, like, cyber goth twins later who look like they're from The Matrix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, in the background. The Matrix <laughs> is another movie that owes a lot to this. Yes, like, for sure. Like, a whole lot. For sure. Um, but, yeah, there's just some great extras in this movie. I'm sorry that you didn't like that you didn't like those ones. And then um, immediately after that shot, there's a shot of some, like, horse just, like, in the market. And I was like, okay, the scene with Deckard was really cool, like, enhancing the pick. He got to, like, find the next clue, whatever. <laughs> And then I have to look at a bird and a horse. <laughs> and also there's an ostrich jump scare. I wrote that down yeah, dude. for your sake. It was terrible. Uh, that he walks through a bunch of ostriches. Because he's in like a synthetic animal yeah. market Scary. to get this analyzed. Um, and it turns out it's a snake scale that was manufactured. And Deckard then tracks down the creator and finds out who bought the snake and travels to the nightclub of Taffy Lewis who bought it because it would have been really expensive. So at the nightclub, he tries to talk to Taffy and basically gets dismissed. And then a lot of this movie is him not doing a good job than getting upset and drinking. Um, so he does that. And then he calls Tyre, uh, not Tyrell. He calls Rachel from a vid phone, <laughs> which I love, which is like uh, basically FaceTime, but it's a telephone booth yeah uh, and he's like come out with me come come meet me like where are you like you up yeah, basically. basically like it was the you up of the time yeah. to come meet him at the bar and she's like no that sounds like it fucking sucks so i'm not gonna do that Go and boss. then he's like okay whatever uh, and then he sits <laughs> down while drinking um and he drinks a lot in this movie oh, and yeah. actually i really regret not getting it when it came out but when 2049 came out johnny walker released a specific blade runner blend that came in like the futuristic looking bottles from the movie Mm. with like his cool tumblers Mm. and i really should have gotten them because i was 21 that was when i turned 21 (laughs) Uh, and now they're like at least 500 dollars for the bottle 
and it was like black label so it wasn't even like anything <laughs> yeah, <what? laughs> super great That's funny. um anyway back to the movie he watches salome and the snake perform and so he's like oh well that's the fucking synthetic snake and then he goes to meet the star of the show and like does this weird nerd i hated act. this part. like i'm really surprised he didn't just like put on glasses with like tape in the middle yeah, seriously. and like all that stuff and like some suspenders <laughs> and he's just like you know while i'm from the union honestly i love harrison ford's performance here he's really funny he's a funny guy when he wants to be and it made me laugh when he does this. He pretends to be someone who's, like, from the Union to talk to Salome, uh, who is really Zora. And, like, she sees through it basically immediately, but, like, is kind of just fucking with him. And she's just, like, titty out right in front of yeah, him. And he's, like, talking about how, weird. like, people will drill will drill holes in the wall to look in as he's in there. Um, and she goes, showers, and then just, like, kicks him in the chest and like tries to kill him and then leaves yeah (laughs) she runs away and then we get this chase through the sea uh the city streets with zora and it's here and early in the movie it's kind of easy to see like the isolation played out in the cinematography of the movie and specifically like the shot composition as it's a lot of like shot reverse shot Uh people are rarely seen interacting with each other in the same frame so that's why when deckard and rachel do it feels more special and like a more meaningful connection uh because even in this chase scene as they're running through the streets of la and she's like you know trying to hide from him a lot of the shots are close-ups on each of their faces but separate amongst a crowd of just faceless people walking by uh so while the visuals and big grand cinematography is fantastic of this movie and honestly it's kind of even better in 2049 but we'll get to do that next week um even these like small details, I think, are really, really cool and really important as well. Um, again, this scene just kind of reminds me that I love the environment, the cyberpunky environment. Mm-hmm. It was this where I like specifically started thinking of the game Cyberpunk because yeah. of like they're running through the streets and chasing Shooting someone down. Stuff. I don't know if I there also... was a specific thing for you that was like, oh yeah, they they put that in the game for sure. Like several things, like even the one. Um... Like, the first time you, you go in a shoot, what's his name? The freak who, who makes the toys, whatever. When you go into, like, his, yeah, when you go into his, like, apartment building, it, like, literally looks like the building in the game where, and I don't remember if this was, like, an optional thing or not, but there's, like, one thing where you can go into a club, and it, like, mm-hmm. looks like the room before you get to the club, and I was like, this is ridiculous, <laughs> like, the amount of shit that, like, is reminding me of that in the movie. But during this scene during like the chase scene i was thinking that would be a pretty sick uh halloween costume to just literally wear a black bra and underwear and then just a clear raincoat and heels i was like that's sick (laughs) zora and pris are like really popular yeah like cosplays and stuff pris especially with like the eye well yeah she has that for sure um i was like like, that's very funny i gotta say later in the movie you see rachel take her hair down and the hair in this movie not that inaccurate from like now from like 2019 2022 of like people bringing shag hair back and mullets and stuff Mm -hmm. and very like 80s looks um like pris's hair if i saw someone with that like in a convenience store or at a bar i'd be like yeah yeah not in the original like pinup that she has on but when she takes Mm -hmm. her hair down it's like the same cut yep oh yeah when when rachel has her weird bun thing yeah, no way. yeah. but like pris's like shaggy thing oh yeah, yeah deckard's yeah, yeah. hair yeah, yeah. is pretty i mean man, man hair for men is basically the same uh, all the time but even that like he has kind of like a little bit of like a cool thingy going on but anyway i just wanted to point that out here <laughs> um but yes yeah, zora would you do zora pre or post gunshot because spoiler alert she gets shot in the chest I right mean, now post would be cooler but also yeah. she has to run through 27 windows before she gets shot so mm. that was a lot <laughs> i'm excited to see uh talking about like blood effects for costumes this halloween how many people do chrissy from stranger things but like with the bleeding yeah gross eyes and stuff uh really literally cool. anyone that was a cheerleader for a previous halloween will be her yeah. <laughs> like easy <laughs> but yes thank you for pointing out she jumps through a bunch of like glass yeah. and crashes through them and dies and then uh, this is like a really sad scene because it kind of just shows how human she is she just kind of like hits the ground she doesn't explode there's no sparks 
or like oil coming out of her. She is entirely flesh and blood human uh, and was like terrified and running for her life um, because that's all they wanted was just more life. And it kind of just like pits you into a moral battle and like, is Deckard a good person? Uh, is he a good guy? Uh, is he a morally good person who's now forced to do this work that he now he hates because of how bad it is? Mm-hmm. And it's just a really nice scene to kind of show that as his first boss battle. Uh, <laughs> Leon also witnesses this. Um, and Deckard then immediately after killing her goes to buy liquor to drink and... <laughs> This is a cool scene because it's like he's so shaken by it and so upset and clearly trying to just make a connection with the lady at the checkout. Like he's like, is this enough money? Instead of like just kind of giving her the money and leaving. Like he's trying to talk to somebody uh, because he clearly lacks that in his life and wants that. Yeah. Um, and then Gaff shows up, has him talk to Bryant. Bryant calls them skin jobs, which, you know derogatory slur from the chief uh brian asks deckard to now track down rachel as well because he's like well that's one down four to go and then deckard's like no it's three to go and he's like oh no it turns out tyrell has one too so you gotta kill her as well and he's like uh, i'm not gonna do that <laughs> and this is when rachel shows up sorry um rachel shows up uh kind of in the distance dressed like that ikea monkey from the meme like of the little monkey <laughs> in the big jacket this yeah. was my observation that i was <laughs> yeah. proud about she literally it's she so came true. on screen and i was like that's it that's the that's meme the like monkey. that's precisely the little ikea monkey <laughs> oh sitting God. there um, <laughs> i love that meme. <laughs> but before deckard can like go talk to her leon attacks him and like beats the shit out of him this deckard is, is losing this harrison is fast. so jiggly in this scene his yeah. cheeks are like flapping and he's, he's just getting like thrown around <laughs> like this was when i was yeah. like damn harrison's really getting like beat up in this movie <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly exactly and he like forces his lifespan out of deckard he's like how long do i have he's like four years he's like i was made in 2017 yeah. uh oh no i did that um, did remind me of the uh when it's like you know, like younger people saying their birthday, and they're like two thousand and, and it's like and there's more, <laughs> like twenty seventeen. <2017? laughs> Dude, this is just Deckard versus Gen Z. It's Let's, true. It's not even Gen Z. I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, it's like not even named yet. <laughs> yeah. Then Leon's like, wait, and one of the you know famous lines from the movie and this scene is "Wake up, time to die" as he's about to kill Deckard, but then Rachel shoots him in the head. Um, and he just kind of falls down dead. So there's a boss fight that Deckard didn't really win, but we'll give the dub to Rachel. Um, then we get a scene of Deckard and Rachel back in his apartment. Uh, I wrote down early 80s Harrison Ford bod and then the looking on my eyes emoji. Uh, <laughs> Jesus. I was like, Jealous. <laughs> I Like, that's that's the, that's the, the blueprint, you know? <laughs> sure. Like, he looks good, but he's not, like, overly... Like, I can never look like Chris Hemsworth or Chris Evans or any of, like, the current action stars. But 80s action stars, like, they're attainable <laughs> bodies. Um, and you know he just got that from, like, doing carpentry on the side. He, like, wasn't working <laughs> out. Fucking yeah. Goddamn. And Rachel is like, would you ever hurt me? Uh, and he's like, no. He now owes her one. He owes her his life because she saved it. Mm-hmm. Like, so he's like... Even though I wouldn't hurt you anyway, like, now I owe you something. So, like, I couldn't morally do that. Yeah. Um, and this is the scene you mentioned where his eyes might also be glowing. Yeah, because uh, it's, background. like, clear that hers are, but if you look at his yeah. for a split second, they are. Because it's one of those shots where people are interacting with each other in the same shot. Mm-hmm. Nah, 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 nah. Um, Deckard may or may not have seen her and her in it. Her, incept date her birthday basically and the longevity of her lifespan but he's not really clear on whether or not he did uh and then this is where we kind of get into the question of is deckard a replicant where she asks him have you ever taken a void comp test yourself like do you know whether or not you are a replicant Mm -hmm. sir and he does not and then he I, i wrote man's schlumped at this point he just is drunk and tired and beaten up 
and falls asleep on his couch or Holding his a bed, shot on his couch belly. bed thing. Yeah, with his little shot. I was shot, like, how did he cool not, like, <laughs> like, he didn't, like, knock it over. <laughs> That's, like, <laughs> dedication. <laughs> just imagine him, like, if she wasn't there, getting startled awake and just going, <laughs> and then going back to sleep. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Rachel starts perfectly playing the piano, which wakes him up, and he's like, oh, have you played before? And she was like, I guess not. Like, I have memories of lessons, but those weren't mine but i can still play this perfectly mm-hmm. um this is where i observed that her hair for 2019 ain't half bad as a, as in terms of a prediction um this also is just like straight vibes this scene the music just the feel of his apartment and stuff um this is where you start to question as jess said is he gonna fuck a robot is he or not robot row person <laughs> row person. <Ro> thing <laughs> um and they're like kind of catching feelings for each other at this point and she goes to leave and he stops her and this was it's weird. only mildly creepy uh, mildly, then it gets more creepy it was and so i fucking wrote down creepy. yeah this scene doesn't hold up very well not at all um <laughs> they kiss and like i assume have sex or whatever yeah we'll get past it uh this is also the next it's shot after that it. yeah it's well if we need to we should probably he's just, like it's, holding it's he's pin, yeah he's like he, he basically forces her to stay, forces her to stay and then and pins then her against the window and is like you're gonna kiss me and then she's like kiss me and like did you want him to girl or <laughs> were, were you forced into that please <laughs> like, yeah i don't know well we mad. don't know her we don't know her kink test results it could, this, could okay, be into that fair, we don't know. i guess no i'm kidding it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. pretty fucked up what, what he does to her yeah. um and then we get the third shot of in the movie of that geisha ad let's fucking go i love that one it (laughs) has such a cool aesthetic to it um we are now back to pris and sebastian roy has now shown up at sebastian's he makes eggs for them in an egg boiler thing i thought that was um yeah uh sebastian reveals that he has a condition that makes him rapidly age much like them he is only 25 years old and looks like he's like 50 Mm -hmm. and Roy is, like, clearly disturbed by Sebastian's quote-unquote toys or friends or whatever you want to call them because, like, for him, they're him, like, as well. They were created from nothing by a person on their own to serve a specific purpose, and it's, like, so clearly they're put on display and and used, and you never really know what's going on with them. Um, Sebastian reveals that he's a nexus six stan when he like finds out that they are and he's like asking them all these questions and he's like really really impressed by them uh you know reveals that he helped design them this is also where it's like pretty clearly stated that they aren't computers or robots because he's like oh we'll do something and he's roy's like i'm not a computer you can't just like input a request of me and i'll do it immediately um I'm still and gonna they... say that Deckard fucked a robot, though. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Whatever. Pris then quotes, "I think, therefore, I am," which is more or less like the main theme of the movie of yeah. like if you can, if you have consciousness and sentience and feeling and everything, then hey, guess what? You're a person. It doesn't really matter where you started mm-hmm. from. Um, and Roy convinces Sebastian to take him to Tyrell by doing. By getting Sebastian to beat Tyrell in chess for the second time ever as they, like, were now in an elevator going up to see Tyrell. And, uh, basically, Roy feeds Sebastian the next move to to win the game, which allows, uh, Tyrell then allows Roy and Sebastian into his apartment. Which, again, is one that's like, yeah, you're rich, but, like, what the fuck is this room, dude? Yeah. He, like, sleeps in a museum, basically. Yeah. (laughs) Um... Roy and Tyrell meet and this is one of the best scenes in the movie probably it's like kind of the climax of Roy's story of his goal to extend his life Um, and you know he's like hey is there a problem Tyrell says that and Roy answers that death is the problem he says I want more life father referring to Tyrell as his father and creator um and he's exceptionally sweaty in this. I don't know what it is about uh, this movie, but 
this scene in particular, I was like... Roy or Tyrell? Roy. Or both? Like, they... Just everyone is so sweaty in this movie. And this yeah. is another, like, do they not have AC? Do they not have vacuums? <laughs> like <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. I think Roy maybe might be more sweaty because he's dying. He's dying. Quickly. Yeah, which yeah. I then understood that, like, as they were talking. But, like, at one point he's looking, because they're, they're sitting really close to each other, and he's looking over at Tyrell. And I was like... That, like a drop of sweat just fell off his nose. I'm like, this man, get him a towel. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but then Tyrell reveals that basically from day one, their coding sequence is unchangeable. Once the replicant is made, he can't change their lifespan. He has only four years. And he's basically at the end of that at this point. Um... And Tyrell says the light that burns twice as bright burns twice as uh, half as long Mm -hmm. and says, you know, he's proud of Roy and Roy has burned so brightly. Um, Roy then gives him a kiss of death and crushes Tyrell's head and goes in through his eyes, which great effect, but, you know, kind of adds to this ever constant presence of eyes um, do I, does that freak you out or is it only no. feet for you that not feet, feet trauma? Well, not feet necessarily. Leg like trauma. as far as Lower like, leg trauma. yeah, like, like ankles or like, yeah. Um, yeah. my note for this part was OMG so hot. I want to be kissed and then have my skull crushed. And, <laughs> By Rutger and then Howard, like 20 he heart emojis. I was like, that's so cute. Oh my God. Goals. <laughs> 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 Who I also have to mention, R.I.P. Rutger Hauer. He died a few years ago as well. Yeah, twenty. He died in twenty nineteen. That's I did notice so that did when Roy. I was. I mean, again, this is a forty year old movie. But when I looked up like the IMDb to like That's you know could, when I would recognize like people's faces or like their voices or whatever, and I was like every single person like in the cast is white haired now, and it's crazy. I was like, mm-hmm. damn, like I don't know. I didn't like yeah. realize it was forty years until I realized it was forty years old. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and Sean Young, who plays Rachel, has had not the best life um, either, unfortunately. She she went through quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, she's doing better now, but, you know, had, had some struggles uh, and stuff. Uh, there's a really infamous story about her trying to become Catwoman in Batman Returns with Tim Burton, which you can look up, which uh, is a little funny, but, you know, also... You know, she's 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 gone through it and oh my god oh no my 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 replicant is talking oh to me <laughs> dude we had oh i can't believe we had a cameo from her i can't believe she's we listening. got her on the show she's wow. listening she's like i like that movie <laughs> what did i say that sounded like alexa i have no idea oh my god okay sorry about that i'm leaving that in because it's funny um but also this movie is why i'm always kind to my devices because you never know what what's going on up sure. there with them um i really like this scene and and i like your note of sweatiness is the do you have any other like notes or impressions from this scene or any other scenes in the movie that i might have glossed over quickly that you want to go back to before we kind of kick no, it no not end? necessarily backtracking i think like at this point in the movie i was like okay now i'm getting into it because the first like half of the movie is just so slow mm-hmm. and then like once he starts actually killing, like, the the replicants, then I was like, okay, okay, like, I understand where this is going. And I, this was when I was, like, looking up Reddit carefully, because I didn't want, like, spoilers, because obviously Spoiler, I was, yeah. like, w- actively watching it. But I was like, why is everyone so obsessed with this movie? Because I was getting to the point where I was like, this is so slow. Like, how is this such, like, a phenomenal, like, well-looked-upon movie? And one of my notes, I was even like, maybe I'm just not enough of, like, a fil- film bro to, like, understand it. But then it picks up, and, and, like, as Tyrell's, like, explaining everything, I was like, oh, now I'm getting it (laughs) like it was like I like was just short of the like understanding it and like getting into the movie aspect of it literally as he's like explaining you know basically all the answers that he wants to hear or doesn't want to hear based on our conversation so far you're liking it more than I thought you would because this is a movie I didn't really even like on my first watch it took me a couple and also 2049 which I like more helped me to like this more as well so I did also Hats off to have you as well, well. I did also have. I mean, forgetting it all. We'll and, and get. We'll get to my rating that, yeah. later. But like, mm-hmm. this is another case where I'm like very appreciative of the movie. But like, I don't think in all it was for me. But also, it was like my first time watching it. Forty years after me, I'm just gonna yeah. keep you know being broken. Record. It's a movie but like, that totally improves on 
more watches because you also like notice more yeah especially with the question about deckard uh that kind of gets more yeah basically asked at the end of the movie back when you like watch it multiple times yeah you can kind of but i pick also up on like reasons even as to why or why not like yeah yeah i watched it yesterday but like i feel like in thinking about it like i didn't write my like usually i do all my notes at once but i like did i like waited to do my rating character and favorite scene until like right before mm-hmm. we started recording because i was like i do think i have to think about this because i didn't want to go into it being like four it was boring you know like because i was like let me like think about it and like think of the impact and like read a little bit more on it just because i like you know there are plenty of movies that i'm like like I don't know, Leprechaun or whatever. I'm like bad movie, hated it, haha. Oh yeah, well, but that's then a like gut this, reaction. but this is like so <laughs> well made and it makes so much sense. Like you know, so like I wanted to like understand the impact of it before being like, yeah, it was slow. Like yeah, it's an old movie. Of course, it's gonna be slow. <laughs> like you know what I mean. And I totally. also like I don't watch like detective stuff ever, so I was like that aspect honestly, also felt slow because like I don't really like that kind of media anyway. You know, as you said, we well, we can get more into it when we have the review. But I think this movie great vibes great villain and all that uh but you know it's not super deep on the plot front and that's why i like 2049 more which hopefully you might too um because i kept writing in my has, notes i might like that more just because it's newer <laughs> it has the vibes and everything but i think it has a better story exactly uh, and a more clear cut not clear cut but a it's much more of a detective story like he is literally trying to solve a mystery yeah in 2049 and you know he's finding clues and it's it's much more of a plot uh than, than yeah this one exactly is. exactly yeah um so we now get some great shots of the spinners which are the flying cars kind of going through the air which i love the design of them mm-hmm. um and actually funnily enough one of them was used in a movie with kurt russell a few years later called soldier <sighs> probably just because they had the prop but be in doing so ultimately made that movie canon and the blade runner oh that's so funny because <laughs> it's like about like people like space marines like fighting off-world battles it's like well it could very well be in the same universe yeah. some people think that alien is in the same universe as this oh my god and all that stuff um deckard is now at sebastian's apartment and we kind of kick into the finale here uh pris disguised herself as a toy while Deckard kind of goes up the stairs and this sequence of him going up the stairs I never really like caught on to it before again speaking to why this movie is great on a rewatch but it's just so pretty like him going up this amazing spiral staircase with like really really cool architecture to it um oh it's actually a real building the Bradbury building uh in Los Angeles has those really cool ornate stair this like really cool stairway with really cool um ornate uh banisters and and designs to it and it, just the lighting that's coming in and like doing the cool silhouette of him with his awesome gun and cool coat i was like yeah this is this is this is peak cinema to me <laughs> this is um, the vibe <laughs> yeah precisely also before we go into the end deckard is an important character in this movie of course I just want to give you some other options as to who could have played him, apparently, from the time people who were considered for Deckard. Would you like to hear Gene Hackman, Sean Connery, Jack Nicholson, Paul Newman, Clint Eastwood, Tommy Lee Jones, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Peter Falk, Nick Nolte, Al Pacino, and Burt Reynolds? Could you fucking imagine Arnold Schwarzenegger? (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) vastly different movie yeah i love Arnold. Schwar- he's a great actor at what he does but yeah it, this but is I not just, his vibe. solely for his voice <laughs> yeah no it would not have that would be so funny. not have worked as well but i can't imagine anybody else uh here but let's continue deckard um goes into sebastian's house and it's filled with just like his different toys going off a lot of I wrote, uh, it's, marionettes <laughs> yeah I, I wrote it's giving tourist trap a little bit which yeah, is yeah. a great movie to check out if you're listening to this jess loved it great. Uh, a lot she great is a recommends strong it to word everybody <laughs> it's hasn't aged a day um um, uh, <laughs> it is freaky though it is a freaky is movie freaky. to watch it and it's is. age kind of now lends to how freaky it is and ugh, yeah it just <laughs> makes me feel icky and dirty thinking yeah. about that movie um then we enter the pris boss battle as she kicks him in the chest uh another and, girl boss moment yeah <laughs> is that just 
him getting kicked in the chest a girl boss moment by default? I guess so now, Does yeah. Roy have a girl boss moment later? Uh, yeah, I'll bring it up when it, <laughs> when it happens, yeah. Um, but she, like, does her cool flip onto his head and is, like, crushing her his head between her thighs and, like, sticks her She fucking picks his, his nose. nose. What the hell was that? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> like, who, like, imagine, I literally wrote... <laughs> I literally wrote my notes. Imagine filming this scene like, all right, here's your direction. First, you're going to put your thighs around him and you're going to like kind of fight a little bit and then just like fucking pick his nose. Just go at it. And then you're going to thrash around on the ground when he shoots you. Like, it's just like so bizarre. (laughs) Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. So she jumps. He he shoots her and she on the ground. Literally like a glitching. Like she's clipping through the wall, basically. Like that's what she looks like. Yeah, she the freaks out, physics he were shoots on her a lot, million. and she dies. Yeah. Um, then Roy starts to get back to apartment, uh, Sebastian's apartment, um, and Deckard hides. He kisses Pris's dead body, but, like, her tongue is, like, out, because she died, and she's like, bleh. And he, like, fully, like, takes it into it. It, it was a little yeah. gross. I was like, what the There's fuck? A, there were several questionable things that I was like, this is one of the greatest movies of all time. This and um, this scene that I'm watching right now. <laughs> but now we get into the, the big final battle yes. between Harri- uh, Harrison Ford, between Deckard and Roy, which isn't really much of a battle if not just kind of Roy playing with Deckard because he is so much faster and stronger than Deckard is. Yeah. Um, Roy busts through a wall at one point. That's and his girl boss moment. <laughs> fingers awesome uh so he can't use his gun very effectively uh to kind of level the playing field in roy's opinion oh wait um, he has two girl boss moments oh yeah he does he has two he girl boss is all over the place his his girl boss is busting through walls yeah and then the other two girl boss is uh just kicking him in the chest <laughs> This is where I wrote, Rutger Hauer really put his whole rut gussy in this. He did. Uh, and he really does in this scene. It just, like, shines through. He's fucking amazing in this yeah. movie. Um, then he, like, starts howling, and I, I wrote, is Roy a furry? Yeah. In 2019, I'd believe it. Yeah, it was a little, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He then, like, strips down to his undies and is running around in, like, this leaky, gross... A ba- basically abandoned building at this point it's all dark the lights coming through the windows in a really cool way yeah um it's just such a specific feel it's just like such a rotted forgotten part of this city where there's also like super high-tech skyscrapers and all yeah. that shit it's just like really interesting to see the verticality of the the world and what the closest to street level is like versus the rich and mostly white uh, i'll mention uh because on the uh, the higher levels, because on the street level, the poorer areas, you see a lot more multiculturalism, specifically Asian cultures, because I think in this world it's, like, kind of uh, a blending of, like, Japanese and American culture at this point in mm-hmm. the West Coast, um, um, which is really cool to me. Like, it was to see. it was uh, cool, though, too, like, as he's walking through, like, the building, like, because they're, because since uh, Roy's just, like, toying with him, like, he's just, like, saying stuff as uh, mm-hmm. Deckard's, like, walking around. And it kind of hit me, like, not necessarily, like, I think the words I'm going to use aren't going to necessarily make my point, but, like, it gave more of kind of, like, a psycho, like, like kind of like a like a psycho carnival type vibe because it was like there were all the like toys around which like yeah. felt really out of place but then like him speaking like it felt like the hall of mirrors effect like obviously he wasn't yep. walking literally through mirrors or like it wasn't that on the nose but like the fact that he was he didn't know where he was but he could hear him and like the creepy vibe of the apartment itself was really weird and then like but knowing that this is like a sci-fi movie and like they're you know man-made not robots but i'll just use that term very loosely but like they're like this man-made thing Beings. so instead of it being yeah. a very like sci-fi like in the matrix where the final fight is this like crazy like physics whatever and this was so like people get punched in the throat multiple times yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> but this is more of like that kind of like psychological meditative yeah, yeah and not and carnival's like the wrong word but just it gave that kind of vibe where it's like more twisted and like no, in I your mind exactly. than like you know yeah. which i guess fits with the existentialism of the movie too but i was just like this is a cool like last scene vibe instead of making it like them just like fucking decking each other in the face for yeah like i mean 20 minutes adds, you know 
so much more in the comparison of what they are because if you read that this movie Deckard is a human then this makes this scene even more impressive of just like showing how much faster stronger and basically smarter Roy yeah. is um, because like Deckard's vocabulary throughout the movie has been pretty basic versus Roy's almost like Shakespearean yeah. way of talking mm-hmm. uh, in this scene he's talking in basically like disparate thoughts and quotes and whatnot exactly um, yeah but he is just so much more eloquent than the gruffer uh, human Deckard, uh, mm-hmm. if you if you take that reading. Yeah. There's also just like so many. I, I want to mention. I mentioned like how there's like kind of a multicultural feeling at the bottom level of L.A. Mm-hmm. And there's so many scenes which we didn't touch on because they're not really important to the plot. But why you should watch the movie? There's just these little like bits and details. Like in one scene, I think it's Roy and Leon are like walking to meet Chu, and then the camera just pans over, and there's like a bunch of people just on bikes going through mm-hmm. and it lasts like maybe 15 seconds but it just really helps like flesh out the world that they're in yeah but back to the f- fight that's not really a fight one um, one other thing real quick is that when uh deckard's fingers get broken harrison ford literally barks like the sound yeah. that he Mark. makes is just <laughs> him barking <laughs> yeah. um, i just wanted to point that out <laughs> i also noticed that roy only breaks two of his fingers one for pris one for zora because deckard didn't kill leon Rachel yeah did. yeah true um and then Deckard is now, like, basically, like, not really focused on killing or incapacitating Roy. He's just trying to get the hell out of there. Yeah. Uh, and he's, like, climbing up this big uh, arm war thing to get to the next level of this rotting house uh, building thing. He drops his gun at this point, so he can't even use it anymore even though he couldn't really before but now he definitely can't yeah um this the backdrops in this scene too like as he's trying to climb up and over like the windows or like trying to climb around and then like go up onto the the roof like the backgrounds looked really cool they kind of reminded me of like an old disney movies where they have like a painting and then they like mm-hmm. superimpose like the people the mats top. yeah yeah mats that's i always forget the word for them um but i want to see like the originals of them because they looked so cool i bet like the originals are like so fucking sick you yeah, know because obviously you're like supposed finding... to be looking at harrison ford blah 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 because you're watching the movie but i was like i want to see the background <laughs> this is another movie we're finding pictures to post for our instagram post it's yeah easy and i and surprisingly had trouble with alien so i don't know man whoa okay well because wow. if i searched alien still it gave me every single alien movie so this i think if i do blade runner it's gonna be like yeah. fan art and shit this is a this is a, a uh pho- a phone and pc wallpaper movie yes for sure uh, i'm pretty sure i already have a blade runner wallpaper in my lineup somewhere <laughs> um because i have it alternate in the in the background um then Roy is now, like, really feeling himself dying, like his fingers are going discolored and weird, so he gives himself stigmata in one of his hands. I was like, okay, all right. And then Deckard thinks he's kind of gotten some respite, and he's sitting in, like, an old, gross bathroom, and Roy then girl bosses, (laughs) busts through the the wall, and is is like... You better get her up, or this else I'm a, gonna kill ya. This and was like, another moment where I just like same with like it was like the glass <laughs> breaking in the car, and then this I just like lost my fucking mind. <laughs> yeah, like he uh. just fucking pokes his head through. <laughs> <laughs> He's a funny villain. He Earlier in the movie, so he also funny. like does the eye thing with especially because like, like, like in like, this two eyes. Oh, yeah, really but especially good. like in this scene, like he's so. he's so menacing like and like him killing tyrell was so scary and then like him just walking around and knowing that like you know he's way overpowered deckard just fucking punches his head but also like is that not what a fight with a giant superpowered four-year-old would be like it's true it's true (laughs) um and so deckard then books it out of there and busts into a room that can only describe as your worst nightmare as it's just a room and immediately just a <laughs> burst of birds and it's all filled pigeons, with pigeons. Are nasty. and he like runs through there he's climbing the outside of the building going to the roof and roy just like sticks his head out the window and just like commenting on it he's just like uh okay like haha you're doing that and like deckard's like fighting for his goddamn life here. <laughs> Again, uh, cheeks flapping all over the place. Yeah, like. and he gets up to the top after a lot of struggling. It's probably like a five-minute sequence. It is. From when he goes out the window to when he reaches the roof. Yeah. Um, 
and Roy is just up there. So Deckard immediately turns around and tries to run and jump to another roof, barely makes it, and is holding on to a girder that's sticking out the side of the building, mm. but he is not doing too well. Nope. Um, Roy makes the jump pretty effortlessly while holding a dove that he found. That, um, I, like, do we, did I miss him picking up the dove? No, I'm pretty sure he just found it. On okay, the roof because or I was like, "Why is he holding his hand?" And then like he like you know another or shot or whatever, and I was room. like, "Maybe, maybe." But I was yeah. like, "Where did he just pick up a fucking bird?" <laughs> and Roy says one of the other famous lines from the movie: "Quite an experiment to live in fear." Mm-hmm. That's what it's like to be a slave. Um, and saves Deckard instead of letting him die. He kind of shows mercy in his final moments. Mm-hmm. And then Roy really starts to die now, like he cannot function, and delivers one of probably the best death speeches ever in any movie. Yeah. That goes like thus. Oh my god. I have it memorized. Jesus Christ. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watch sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser Gate. All those moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain. Time to die. Basically saying, I have had some experiences, I have memories, I've lived a life, but when I die, all that goes with me. So what's, like, what was my point? What was my purpose? And then he (laughs) croaks and dies right there in front of Deckard on the roof. And the dove flies away. Oh, dude, I love, it's like, it's one of the only quotes i would ever consider getting a word of printed tattooed on my body (laughs) yeah it's it's like has to be something like that i'd probably get that like some sort of reference to tears and rain with the either unicorn origami from this or there's a horse statue in the next movie that's Mm -hmm. really important something like that and this is like just one of the most important scenes in the movie one of the most iconic easily um is this monologue this monologue i'm on the wikipedia page for blade run right now this monologue has its own wikipedia page oh that's funny um and i did think it was like sorry go ahead a fair amount of it uh was was improv or uh kind of just influenced by rutger hauer's delivery um which is or he like helped write it um he cut i'm I'm reading right now this is a live reading right now live (laughs) reading moment uh cut the original scripted speech by several lines cutting it down and added the line all those moments will be lost in time like tears and rain which i think is the best line of it so way to go rutger hauer um as the rain is coming down and kind of washing his body of the blood and he also had like drywall on his head yeah. and all that stuff um and and yeah it's just it kind of shows how even though he did kill quite a few people he was ultimately right in the end like it's mm-hmm. really fucked up what they had to go through yeah um the slow it sounds like i'm getting chucked up idea, but though. i'm not i swear to god i'm not it's just because i've been talking for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the slow-mo death was a very interesting choice, though. That made me kind of giggle yeah, in a moment that I shouldn't have been. <laughs> I think it was because, it's I don't know 80s. if that's in the original <laughs> cut, but if it was even in the 80s, they would have shot it in slow-mo, so it would have looked better. This clearly was not a slow-mo shot. Exactly, yeah. And got, yeah, done later, which kind of sucks, but it's cool. The dove flies out into, like, kind of a little patch of sunlight coming through the... Uh, ever cloudy la skies Mm -hmm. and he dies um and this like scene deckard is just sitting there observing and you really start i really love harrison ford's acting here no voiceover needed of (laughs) without saying anything just using his face and his eyes he just like he gets it now like he really deckard understands um how why they were doing what they were doing why what he was doing was kind of the wrong thing to be doing of hunting them down. He really understands what they were going through. Um, And I really appreciate that. And and it's a really, I say really a lot, but it is a really, really good scene. It's one of the best out there. I don't know what your take was on this, aside from 
the slow mo, but <laughs> uh, you've probably heard me talk about it a billion times before, anyway, or quote it. Or Not really. Something I here, don't really. Think... Yeah. Uh, well, I know it's one of the only movie monologues I know off the top of the dome now at this point. Just I in also case. tend to had you talked about it before. Like I don't have a memory like you do. If mm-hmm. you talked about it, something I hadn't <laughs> seen or didn't know what you were talking about before, it's gone. <laughs> like now I'll know every time we talk about it since. But I like. You know. Yeah. I wouldn't remember an entire monologue that you've quoted to me before. <laughs> but I mean, like, what was your emotional reaction to the that part, the monologue? Um, I mean, said, I said, like, I said it at the beginning. Point, this yeah, is the, the yeah, this where... is the point where like my brain caught up to like what I was watching, um, and I'll talk about it more when we like read yeah. it officially. It's but like, I was just kind of like, okay, I get it. <laughs> like, the, cool um... scene. I really like that character. So I was like, I mean, duh, he was gonna die, of course, like at a very convenient time, so that Decker doesn't just fucking kick it at the end of the movie. But yeah. Um, or kill him because I feel like if Deckard killed him, it would have. Yeah, it wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Deckard didn't stand a chance. So, so. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, like he um, shot him or yeah, like, stabbed yeah, exactly. him or something because he does beat him with a crowbar kind of effectively yeah, for a little yeah. bit. Yeah. But. Um, but yeah, no. I mean, I thought it was a cool scene, uh, and I liked like the, you know, I feel like it like the whole last sequence. Like I said, since it had that more of like a existential psychological type vibe with it there was also Mm -hmm. i liked the fact that like i forget when exactly it is i think it's when deckard first goes like to the outside of the building and is like holding onto the windows or like trying to move that way yeah um he like leans out uh he like leans out after him and uh like feels the rain for a second i don't know how to like describe this motion with words but he like leans his like whole head and like chest out of the I know window, exactly what you're talking like about. feels yeah. the rain and then like not twirl is like the wrong word he like kind of like like spins himself back into the window and it was like one of those things where i was like he's like on the verge of being a villain that's like one of those like they're so you know they're so smart and like evil that they're like crazy or whatever like like in that way that like just the way he was moving was very like slow and like you know whatever so i thought that was really cool because that was also like he's like you know because it's oh they're basically human so it's like they're you know the way that he was moving and like enjoying the rain for a split second then getting back to like trying to kill the guy or you know seemingly so um, was just, like, a cool moment because, I, I don't know, I liked him a lot, so I was like, this is a cool, like, whole sequence of him and then him dying at the end. I was like, that was a good monologue. I like that. Because a lot of times it's, like, you know, either the villain, the villain uh, like, speech afterwards is, like, I never actually wanted to be like this or, like, you'll never defeat me and then they die. And so this was, like, a cool, like, villain speech where you're like, he's, no, I don't actually think he's a villain. You know what? Yeah, <laughs> like, he was like, this sucks. Yeah. I'm going to go now. Yeah. Just like, um, guess my time's up. Bye. <laughs> but that's like a pretty common thread in film noir of that. I'm glad you mentioned it. Sympathetic villain. Like villains who aren't inherently evil. They're forced into acting the way they are out of desperation for something else. Mm-hmm. And I think by making them into like this slave race of humans, basically, that aren't really viewed as humans by uh, naturally born humans just is a really good shorthand to get you to sympathize for them. Because, mm-hmm. um, like, film noir will have, like, people who are like, oh, I only, like, killed them because, you know, I, I, they, like, forced me to, or, like, I was about to die, or, like, I needed the money to save someone else, or whatever yeah. like that. Like, it's rare that someone's like, yeah, I'm, I'm a film noir villain, and I just fucking love killing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's, like, a very big thing. And, like, the whole, like, you know, Rachel is kind of a femme fatale, as well as sort of both of the female um replicants as well like mm-hmm. there's femme fatales all over the goddamn place uh but yeah roy is dead now goff gaff shows up uh and sees that deckard has done his job gives him his gun back um basically acknowledges that he knows rachel is with deckard and that it's fine like he's gonna not stop them mm-hmm. but he has this line it's uh bad too bad she won't live but then again who does um he says that to deckard as Mm -hmm. deckard leaves deckard then returns home is really cautious thankfully he's at least gone to the hospital and his hands are bandaged up um he finds rachel in his bed sleeping and she's like do you love me uh, sorry, he says to Rachel, do you love me? And she says, I love you. And he says, do you trust me? And she says, I trust you. And so he's like, all right, we're getting the fuck out of here. And they leave. 
and as they're leaving, Rachel knocks or reveals or some some way one of Gaff's origamis that was in uh, Deckard's apartment or was given to her or, you know, it's just there. So maybe Gaff was there earlier, saw her there, booked it. Um, how uh, All we need to know is that Gaff made this little origami thing that Deckard now has, and it's a little origami unicorn hinting to the fact that Gaff knew about Deckard's dreams because Deckard is a replicant and those were implanted in his head and Gaff knew all of that. Gotcha. Um, so is Deckard a replicant or is he not? And then he kind of crushes it in his hands and they leave. And then Fade to Black, fucking banger ending. It's, mm -hmm. it's like so good. Um, and that's the end of Blade Runner. Yeah. Uh, and... Then we go to Blade Runner 2049 next week and those three little short films in between if you guys want to check them out. Um, so that is the end of Blade Runner. How we wrap things up here. Oh, do you have any additional comments for just kind of the end of no, the movies? So. Okay. How we wrap things up here then is that we will give the movie a rating out of 10, say whether or not we liked it, and give our favorite scene and our favorite character um and just kind of you know summarize and and, and uh wrap up the movie for mm -hmm. each other uh do you want me to go first or would you like to go first uh you can go first okay uh this is a, another 10 out of 10 for me like alien maybe sometimes a 9 out of 10 because i think that the second one is better and improves upon it so give it somewhere in that range still mm -hmm. hold it in very high regard mm -hmm. for its uh visuals cinematography story characters uh but mostly uh its impact kind of on the genre and what it did for sci-fi despite the fact that it was a complete flop and not just sci-fi but whole other areas of film um and just kind of this cool new way of doing a noir style film um in the modern day but Yes, it's uh, it's great. It's stuck with me a lot since. I've, it's a movie I've thought about a lot. It's a movie I've read up on um, a fair amount and just kind of always kind of go back to. It's a movie where if someone else is talking about it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I should probably rewatch that again soon. Like that and, and 2049 as well um, are just movies that I can always go back to and just kind of enjoy the world and, and notice things that I didn't notice before and uh, find new parts that I like about it. Or find parts that I don't like or would have improved upon, like wished were improved upon. Um, my favorite scene, I'll say, is, you know, it's easy to say the finale. Uh, I think that's a great scene between Roy and Deckard and it ends with a fantastic speech. Um, but I'm also, I really appreciate kind of the sequence of him hunting down uh, Zora. I think that that's a really important moment for the audience and for him it's not like he shoots her and it's a big triumphant yay he killed one of the bad guys it's met with you know a really sad score a clearly shaken hero and all that stuff so i'd say either that or, or the finale and my favorite character is probably roy batty i think he is one of the best on-screen villains and that the fact that he isn't much of a villain um as we said he killed some people but he is extremely right about what he does and a lot about what he wanted and his kind of legacy, not him as a character, but his ideology is present in the sequel as well. Uh, it's not like he like was a symbol or is a martyr or anything in that movie, but you know, you just, his ideals of them being a slave race that are capitalized on and not allowed a chance to live their own lives um, is heavily pervasive in the sequel, which I'm really excited to see you see. Um, <laughs> and I feel like that affects my rating of this movie, my reading of this movie, and that yours will definitely be different from mine because you haven't seen that and you haven't lived in this world or, you know, read up on it as long as I have. But also, like, major props to you for uh, watching the movie and giving it a <laughs> chance and getting like getting a lot of it your first time you definitely got more than i did my first time 
um i for did sure. i did so. once again just reiterating i did literally like look up <laughs> on reddit like but I, but, but the still. question but the question i looked was why does everyone like this movie so much and mm-hmm. then a lot of the reviews didn't have spoilers like they were just like the meaning like the meaningfulness of the ending blah 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 and i'm like okay okay so i just have to like wait <laughs> yeah know? yeah, yeah. So. It, it all ties together it's definitely yeah. a movie that i'll say if, even though if you listen to this you have the whole thing spoiled don't write it off if you've only watched like the first half as you said yeah. because a lot of it is spent kind of bringing you into this world and it doesn't pull any punch sorry yeah it doesn't pull any punches with the world it doesn't hold your hand and explain a lot it only really explains what replicants are buoyant conf tests and like what a blade also, runner is yeah and i did kind see of yeah i don't want to sorry <laughs> don't, no no go on go on go on Pause um on. yeah so okay i'll just go into it because then i can talk mm-hmm. about it but i be, like i'll give this an eight because i think obviously it was incredibly solid. impactful it was a very solid movie um i just think i'm gonna like the second one more i'm not a big fan of movies that are like slow <laughs> like especially like as i'm finding with like sci-fi i really like the ones that make me go like whoa that's so cool and like at no point did i really do that in this movie and so like I, I was obviously like, okay, the world is so neat, and like, I like the the idea of like, well, how human are they, and whatever. Like, I like that a lot. But I think in the same way that I fucking hated the book 1984, the whole like, big, you know, what is it, Big Brother, like watching you, mm-hmm. and like that whole aspect of this movie, I was like, I don't, care. <laughs> I don't know. But also, again, that's coming from someone that is living in 2022, watching this movie 40 years after it's made. And, like, I know my phone listens to me. I don't really give a shit about it. (laughs) Like, so it's that whole, like, you know, are they human? What really is technology? Like, man-made thing, you know, trying to overcome whatever. I'm like, I think it's cool that computers could at some point, like, think like we do. I'm not scared of this. So, like, watching a movie like this, I'm like, that's so cool that this is the movie that, like, came up with that kind of, you know, question and, like, helped create this kind of genre. But... I've also seen a million things like it since. So well, that's, I don't want to oversell you back. on 2049. It is also a meditative and slower movie. It's just, you know, more modern and it's but how like, it was made. Also, but also the like visuals that I've and, seen of yeah. that movie are so sick. And like oh, <laughs> the visuals yeah. of has, this movie are from the 80s. It has you know a what I mean? much, much better love story in that in the sequel than yeah. in this one. Like that's, it, it's anything a lot with more a love earned. story, anything that um, makes me go holy shit at any point. I'm like that's what I'm finding at least in sci-fi. Like I also yeah. I don't I'm not And it does big deal on... with like the what's human, what isn't. Yeah, and, and I and I like that, that. Isn't initially human make itself yeah. perceived as like does this basically uh oh yeah. No. I was about to make a Mass Effect reference, but you haven't played Mass Effect. The whole does this unit have a soul question from Mass yeah. Effect. Um, oh, God, I'm trying to think of other stuff. I mean, stuff I played, I played, played Prey, and it's the same thing. Prey okay, is just a Mass good, Effect good, knockoff. Good, good, good. But, um, but yeah, or I shouldn't say that, but whatever. Um, I love Dude, that game. Gonna I love that you. game, so I'm allowed to say it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but well, and you're going to play Dead Space soon. I realize that Callis- the Callisto Protocol and Dead Space come out within a month of each other. So that's going to be my favorite month of the year next year. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, I don't know. I like. I obviously I could tell you know what the what the whole impact of it was, but also coming into the movie and being like, you know, I'm not seeing it in theaters in the '80s, and like, so I'm very critical of everything in it. Mm-hmm. In the same way that I kind of was with Alien, and that's why Ooh, I was sorry, so no, no. impressed with Alien because like everything still looked the same same reaction i had in fucking jurassic park i was like that looks real like yeah. <laughs> you know so i was very critical of also it being old because i can't just ignore that you know I'm, so hopefully I'm, yeah whatever. the 2049 but, will be easier to yeah. watch in that respect it's but a lot more that being said also like when i looked up the reddit uh it was i read like literally two comments and i just kept coming back to it because i was like they literally summarized like <laughs> what i understood about this movie but at one point like someone said like you know basically what you said that like it doesn't handhold you but i don't think you needed handholding at all anyway like uh, the fact that not everyone's as smart as you here's the thing though uh, i'm literally not like i was so tired when i watched this movie i had literally just woken up from a nap like and i started watching this movie that also maybe and you'd been at a concert the night before yeah, yeah but i also like i yeah i was piecing it together slowly i tend to like piece together you know how predictable movies end like by the ending anyway but like i did that with this movie and everyone's like it doesn't even need to hold your hand it just like sets the stage and like the movie goes on i'm like yeah but like they like tyrell explains everything <laughs> like at the, yeah, you know at that point in the movie eventually yeah but yeah. it was just funny because i was like i understand what's going on it's not as like otherworldly as like whatever you know so i don't know there were also things like that that i was like 
I'm not seeing the like, you know, it's like high elevated storyline or whatever. But I think that's yeah. just because like I was able to piece it together, and I don't think I'm smart at doing that with other movies. But so also, like, you have I the luxury <laughs> of growing up exposed to that stuff. You played like that's, Cyberpunk again, 2077, yeah, that's so basically a lot of that what it comes back to. Yeah. Just kind of comes back in your brain. That's Which what it really kind of comes back to is that yeah. like I've seen a million things that have been impacted or created because of this movie. So then going back and watching, it, I was like, "All right, I can see, I, I can see it. That's cool. Okay, yeah. <laughs> like you know." There's some um, other fantastic cyberpunk stuff that's come out recently, like Upgrade, Dread. I, we both played through all of twenty seven Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. And honestly, it was okay. It was not nearly as bad. Like, if you played it on a fun it. where it was functioning, it was yeah. actually quite fun. Yeah. Um, and Final Fantasy VII as well, like that remake. There's a lot of... It's been definitely has had a resurgence in the last, like, five to ten years yeah. as a genre. <laughs> Probably Gamers because are never of... going to get bored of space, let's be real. Space well, yeah, but also never going to get bored of it. I feel like it has to do with, like, the world that you're living in and people yeah. getting really, really scared about the economy and technology and all that yeah. stuff like kind of perfectly um, put together yeah. so who was your favorite character so uh, then character and scene were basically the same my favorite character was mm-hmm. roy i thought he i thought it was Oops, cool because we were basically well. following his story just through the perspective of somebody else which I he's thought basically really cool. like the protagonist of the yeah, movie exactly, like even which though I thought the, was really cool at the end i said deckard gets it but more or less from the beginning to now he he at the beginning of the movie he's like I don't want to be a Blade Runner anymore it's fucked up I don't want I don't want to do that yeah but like the movie kind of just cements his judgment that he made before it even started yeah. but I mean you know he is I guess Deckard's technically the protagonist we'll call Roy a deuteragonist which Good is God. a word meaning secondary protagonist yeah uh, but yeah he goes um, through a lot <laughs> yeah he goes through a lot and at first i was just like oh like clearly he's the leader he's like the menacing one whatever but then especially in the last few scenes of you know them fighting and whatever like he's just he's a really cool character i liked mm-hmm. his monologue and i liked like the little moments that as he was chasing uh deckard like like i explained with the window or like him fucking bashing his head through a wall like just like the weird things that he would do i thought he was a cool like interesting and i'm using this with air quotes villain um but i really liked him and then seeing again like almost exactly like you said pretty much the the entire second half fight sequence at the end is obviously like the best part of the movie but if i had to choose another scene it would be the scene where he kills is it zora is that her name yeah um the first one the first yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um just because she was cool and then i liked their little fight and chase scene um and it was a cool, like, running through the city type vibe, which I always enjoy in movies. So, Perfect. character and scene basically the same. Nice. <laughs> yeah, Rating I mean, and viewpoint I, I, a little I different, but it, we knew that. They're great scenes. They're great scenes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, thank you. I mean, I, I thought this episode was going to go a little shorter, but I'm glad that we got into this discussion. Yeah. It's a really meaty movie. It's yeah. one that I, you could honestly do an entire podcast, 10 episodes on just the first Blade <laughs> or just the Blade Runner mythos even yeah. but even just the first one you could do like this is a movie where i know people must study it in high school and stuff like that or like uh it, obviously like film class college but it's one you could probably do in like even a high school english class because there's so much to tear into um as well and yeah it's, it's just one of those things you could totally host a psych- socratic seminar about <laughs> oh um, my god but that was blade runner thank you so much for indulging me, Jess, finally, <laughs> for this movie. I'm very excited to watch 2049 next week. Yeah. To prepare for that, you and everybody listening, there are three short films. I know I've said it already, but just want to reiterate to probably check out before 2049 because that one doesn't really fill much in in what happened in the 30 years between movies. Um, but they are all on YouTube for free on the WB um warner brothers youtube channel they are blade runner blackout 2022 that's the one that's made by shinichiro watanabe watanabe i don't know i'm terrible at pronunciation the creator of uh, cowboy bebop and and a bunch of other fantastic anime um so that is an anime short film about 15 minutes long then there's blade runner 2036 nexus dawn which is six minutes long and has everybody's least favorite character (laughs) actor jared leto in it (laughs) um and then blade runner 2048 nowhere to run which features dave batista who is a much more likable actor um 
So I definitely say check those out in between. You don't have to, but you know, it might just make you enjoy the next one a little bit more or not. Do what you want to do. I can't tell you how to live your life. You're not a, lep- a replicant. A leplicant. Oh my god. A, a leplicant. <gasps> Leprechaun replicant. Shut up. A leplicant. Shut up. End the episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Can we make um, Leprechaun 2049? <laughs> Stop. Oh my god. <laughs> it's not Leprechaun in space. It's before that. But Goodness. I'd love to see it. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, it really means a lot if you leave us a review, a five-star review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. helps us get out there into the algorithm. Uh, and what also can help us, if you like the show, is telling a friend or family member to check us out as well, or a couple of them, because uh, then they might listen to it, they might like it, and then they tell two people, and then they tell two people, and all of a sudden the entire world is listening to our podcast. Wow. Uh, we're a multi-level marketing podcast. Oh my God. <laughs> That's what we are. Uh, you bring in two people and they get added to your bottom line and they bring in two people. Um, and oh my God. if you like us, you can follow us on Twitter at movie night mates. We are movie night mates normally spelled on Instagram and YouTube. You can find me on Instagram at the amazing spider underscore Dan. You can find our other co-host Avery who really regrets not being able to be in a lot of episodes recently, but they're just very busy right now. So, um, at, a missing cap everywhere and jess is miasica underscore everywhere as well thank you so much for listening we will see you next week for the final episode of sci-fi july um <laughs> and then after that we're gonna have a little bit of i don't really know what we're doing for august i'm gonna be away for a little bit uh we're gonna play a little game as of probably our first episode of august just to kind of Add some levity after such deep and existential <laughs> movies. Um, and then. No, we're just going to keep going with the. <laughs> it's just the rest of the year. It's just going to be really heavy, like yeah, really heavy like topic. Shit that you have to really pay attention to. <laughs> um, and then we're going to continue the summer with High School Musical 2, which I was about to say is going to be the first sequel we're covering for another movie we've already covered, but I'm an idiot. We're doing 2049, and literally the second movie we ever covered was Halloween 2018, <laughs> which is a sequel. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I have a bad memory in that, that respect. But yes, look forward to High School Musical 2. Uh, I'm already getting my vocal cords ready uh, to nail those high Zac Efron notes, because that's the one he's actually singing in. <laughs> Thank you so yeah, much sure. for listening. We'll see you next week for Movie Night. Bye.